Hi, this is Nancy Klimas. I'm the director of the Gulf War Illness Research Program at the Miami VA and Nova Southeastern University. We have a lot of different types of research studies underway trying to cure or successfully treat Gulf War illness. But in this conversation today, I really want to address Gulf War veterans who've been exposed to toxins and have chronic illnesses as a result in this time of the COVID-19 infection. I'm asked by many people what they might do, if there are any special precautions they should take, and what kind of risk are they really um, under at this time. In our research, trying to better understand the results of the toxic exposures of the first Gulf War, the 1991 Gulf War, we have seen time and time again that the immune system that deals with viral infection has a problem rapidly clearing viruses. Basically, you have all the right cells, but they're working kind of slow. And there's a lot of reasons why this is true. And a lot of the focus of our science is to try to give you really excellent answers to solve this problem. But you can't wait right now for all of our science to work its way through. And I thought I could give you at least some helpful hints right now. The problem with your immune system cells is the same problem that you're seeing in your brain and in your muscles and other types of cells, which is that the energy of the cell is diminished. There are a couple of different reasons for this, but the main reason is that as you're dealing with the toxic exposures and all kinds of immune activation and all kinds of day-to-day -day toxins that are in our environment, your body isn't clearing these types of toxins as efficiently as it should. And the result is that the cells themselves have a lot of oxidative stress. Oxidative stress happens when your cell tries to make energy and it makes a unit of energy and it flips off um, an electron. And that electron is basically oxidative stress. There's a whole system in the cell that tries to clean that electron up and recycle it back into energy. In a perfect world, you have a perfectly balanced energy production, energy cleanup system. It looks like a little figure eight in the images. Perfect little cleanup system. But in your systems, you're deficient in the uh, antioxidants your body uses to clean the mess up. So the way the cell deals is to say, okay, well, I just won't make more energy. And you have a very fatigued cell, which is how your body feels, how your brain feels, and how your immune system feels. So let's get practical. When you're dealing with a pandemic like COVID-19, there are things you can do to prevent your exposure to the infection. You're hearing an awful lot about that on the news right now. There are things you can do to try to improve your ability to deal with the viruses and clear them before they have a chance to uh, establish an infection. And then there are things you can do to try to help improve your ability to deal with an actual established infection. So let's just roll through those. The things that you can do to try to avoid the infection are the very things everyone's talking about. Six feet of distance between you and everybody in the world, not going out into public places, wiping down the surfaces that other people would touch with alcohol or soapy water to try to kill the viruses that lay on the surfaces, um, not exposing anyone else if you have a cough or a sneeze. Um, but if you are around people that are coughing and sneezing, they should be wearing a mask. It's far more effective if they wear the mask than if you wear the mask but it's also okay for you to wear a mask. So that's the first thing, avoid, 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 avoid. That's why we're doing this national shutdown, just to avoid each other long enough to break the cycle of this um, pandemic. The next thing you can do is wash it off. So wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. 20 seconds, everyone says the way to remember 20 seconds is to sing happy birthday in your head or the ABC song, but I'm sure there's some song in your head you could sing, but wash your hands a little longer than you think you should. Um, and also 
the understand that where this virus goes when it enters your body is it goes up your nose where it attaches to cells or it goes in your lung where it attaches to cells and it establishes an infection. Most of this virus is gonna go up your nose. So rinsing your nose with salt water is a really good idea. And a salt water spray, a little spritzer device to spritz the, spritz the virus out of your nose is one good way to go. Now I know these things have gone off the shelf. So um, you can make your own salt water spray if you want to. It's a quarter teaspoon of salt and a quarter teaspoon of baking soda and a cup of boiled or distilled water. You, rinse, um, you just uh, mix that up real well. And you can either put it in an old spritzer bottle if you've washed the spritzer bottle real well with soap and water or alcohol, um, or you could potentially use a neti pot, one of those little things you stick up your nose and squirt water out the other side of your nose. Pretty disgusting, but can be funny. Uh, anyway, those are ways to keep, uh, keep rinsing. I'm talking to veterans. I've been doing this same talk in more internationally. Internationally, there's a, a spray that we don't have in the United States, a cellulose spray. You spray up your nose and it actually coats your nose with a cellulose, a starch, and blocks the binding sites of viruses in general. And it can reduce your risk for colds and flus. And the coronavirus is a very common cold virus. This one just happens to be more nasty than the ones we've had before but it's the same kind of thing and it can be blocked the same kind of way. We have a nose spray in this country called xylitol nasal spray or xytol nasal spray. It's not quite as good as cellulose at blocking all the binding sites, but it blocks some of them. So that's an idea as well. Another point is that an epithelial cell, which is what's up your nose, the cells that the virus is attached to, if they're irritated and aggravated, they're gonna be more vulnerable to infection. And so and this is particularly true of asthmatics. If you're not really good at taking care of your COPD or your asthma and you tend not to use your inhalers or your oral singular or whatever you're being given to try to quiet down the inflammation in your lung, um, you're gonna be more vulnerable to infection. It's a good time to take good care of your asthma, okay? Same thing with sinusitis. The issue um, with steroid nasal sprays is a little bit iffy, and particularly in your nose because they can irritate your nose. And again, if you get irritated nose, you got an easier viral entry. So, you know, probably for allergies right now, I'd stick with saltwater sprays and not the steroid nasal sprays. So that's prevention. Don't get near it. If you are, rinse it off, wash it off. That makes good sense. Stay away from sick people. And of course, please don't bring this virus home to elderly or infirm people. Um, they can get even sicker. If you have this infection, or you want to try to strengthen your immune system so that you're less likely to get this infection, we go back to that bioenergetics thing I was talking about, about oxidative stress. There are some antioxidants that can help your immune system be stronger, okay? And they are the common ones that we use a lot in our clinical practice, CoQ10. We have a clinical trial right now for CoQ10. Feel free to look at our website and come sign up. But in the short term, if you're taking CoQ10, ubiquinol is uh, the active form of CoQ10. The usual dose is 100 milligrams. It's this, the active form of CoQ10. The um, other form is something called ubiquinone. That's the most common kind out there. The equivalent dose is 300 milligrams. So you gotta read the back of the label there and see which one you got. 300 milligrams of ubiquinone or 100 milligrams of ubiquinol. In our studies, we're using higher doses than that. And actually, in my clinical practice, I tend to double that dose for a couple months to try to get the stores back up into, into better shape. The next most active um, antioxidant uh, that you could take is glutathione. Unfortunately, it doesn't absorb very well. So there's other things you can do we, again, have a study on glutathione. Feel free to go to our website and sign up for that study. It's an important study, um, and it's recruiting. But um, the form that we're using in our study is something called liposomal glutathione. It absorbs much better. It's a liquid, and it's in a little liposome. That's the most active antioxidant in your body. It's very effective in um, improving your antioxidant state. It has a precursor that you can easily buy called NAC, N-acetylcysteine, but on the label it just says NAC, 
comes usually in 600 milligram capsules. This is, uh, gets turned into glutathione in your body, and it has the advantage of being an easy oral form to take, easy to take. And also, um, apparently, by some new studies um, out of Cornell with Dr. Shungu's group, um, it also crosses the blood-brain barrier, which is good news for people with these illnesses because there's a lot going on up there in the brain that we'd like to fix. So um, NAC is probably a good uh, recommendation. You can take it, the label dose, which is twice a day, 600 milligrams twice a day. However, with all of these antioxidants, you're better off not taking them at bedtime. They can give you more energy and make it harder to sleep. So better to take it in the morning and midday or lunch and dinner or something like that than bedtime. Um, that makes good sense. Um, uh, vitamin C is another decent antioxidant. It's best to use that um, in smaller doses. I know it comes in big mega doses, but mega doses, it makes your stomach upset the way IBS, irritable bowel, makes your stomach upset. So taking it 500 milligrams at a time makes more sense than taking a great big whopping 2,000 milligrams or so. So 500 milligrams two or three times during the day makes good sense um, if you're uh, trying to, to improve on your antioxidants. There's one more supplement I'd like to mention. It's something called isoprenosin or inosin. Listen to that well. Isoprenosin or inosin, not inositol. Looks the same on the label, and they're very different. Isoprenosin and inosin are the same thing. It's an over-the-counter supplement. You can buy it online. Um, this um, can improve cytotoxic function and cellular energy. Um, it's a prescription drug in Europe and in Canada, but it's over the counter in this country, but mostly you have to buy it in an online uh, drug store. So again, you just use the prescription, I mean, sorry, use the label doses, but the label doses are um, seven days a week. And I always recommend this one to be taken five days a week. The reason why is it's a protein that breaks down into uric acid. And if you're prone to gout or to uh, uric acid, renal stones, if you take it every day, you could potentially get gout or something like that. So um, taking it five days a week and hydrating well when you take it. But it really does help build your immune system. Whenever you're taking any of these supplements um, that help your immune system or help your antioxidant state, start with one. Make sure you tolerate it. Add the next. Be you know, don't don't just whop down all this stuff all at once in big whopping doses. You're going to feel pretty sick if you do. You want to make sure your body can tolerate them before you um, add any, any other kind of antioxidant. So those are my hints for how to improve on immunity while you're trying to prevent illness or if you are ill, okay? Finally, a little clue about knowing when to go to the hospital. If you do get a virus and you think it might be this virus and you're saying, should I stay home and just get over it or should I show up at the local ER? The clue that you are in trouble and you should go to the ER is if you're really short of breath. It's, this, this infection goes to your lung and it causes a, a kind of a pneumonitis or pneumonia. So if you can't hold your breath for 10 seconds, you probably should go to the ER, okay? But if it's just like a cold and you feel achy all over and all the rest of it, you should probably snug down in bed and hydrate like crazy and get over it. That's my best advice I have for all of you. I'm going to ask as a favor that you um, post this uh, recording and get it around to your friends in, in the Gulf War world, whether it's Gulf War illness or the post 9-11 toxic exposed, burn pit exposed folks. The same advice goes all around. Also, please do know um, at our website, we have a lot of advice for people uh, with toxic uh, illness and toxic injuries, and we have a lot of uh, opportunities for research studies. I'm always begging veterans who have been ill or even healthy people who've been to, in service during the first Gulf War um, to remember that we can't help you unless we can find you, and we can't do these research studies unless you volunteer. So in the same uh, ethic of leave no man behind, it's so important right now in the research for Gulf War illness, a terribly serious illness, that we be able to uh, find folks to recruit into all these research studies so we can give you the answers you're seeking. So remember that. You can find us on our website. Feel free to um, explore the website for more advice. 
but sign up. There's a special study. It's called the survey study. It's a way to sign up so that we can give you information about all the new research coming down the pike and the studies that are going on, not just at our site, but around the country. So uh, at a bare minimum, please go on our site and sign up for the survey study so that we can get in touch with you and keep you informed. So stay safe, stay healthy, and thanks for listening.